we don't hope for a good outcome. We expect it and we have the tools to, to uh, more often than not ensure it. And so my feeling is that if you're sitting at home and you have epilepsy and you've been told that you're, you're never going to be able to drive or you're not going to be able to work, um, that, that may not necessarily be the case. Most times when somebody comes and sees me, um, the, uh, the diagnosis of epilepsy is already uh, pretty well uh, um, made um, either by a, a general neurologist, a pediatrician, pediatric neurologist, so on and so forth. Um, they come to me because uh, the initial medication choices have not been effective and they need a more in-depth diagnosis um, uh, such as localization as to where their seizures come from, uh, what, uh, and then what other advanced techniques are out there for treatment. So in a global picture, about 65 to 70 percent of folks can be controlled with medicines. And so what uh, I, I do initially is to try to characterize their seizures with the, with the studies that I have available to me, the, um, uh, usually uh, an EEG or an MRI that the patient comes in with. And then I also review their medication history and see if there are medicines that are more specific to their type of epilepsy that haven't been tried. Uh, once we go through a trial of a few medications and we realize that uh, the seizures aren't going to be stopped with our conventional medical treatments, then we um, uh, up the ante on our um, diagnostic measures. So this is, this is our MEG um, analysis area. Initially, when uh, a, a patient comes into our, um, our area here, they sit down in this chair that's equipped to um, uh, create um, a virtual map of the, the patient's um, head. So they sit down here, electrodes are placed. Once the electrodes are placed, the patient is taken back into the actual MEG scanner. So this is, this is a, a specially shielded, shielded um, chamber to block external magnetic fields. And it's surprising because there are many things in the environment that can create a magnetic field. Fluorescent lights, computer equipment, even a car in the parking lot, uh, that movement can create a magnetic field that can affect the MEG. So you have to have a shielded room that protects the scanner and protects the sensors from those external fields. Now in the room, which I'm not going to walk into because it creates magnetic interference and those sensors are very sensitive, um, is, a, is a cot and then there's a little helmet shaped opening um, which, is, um, which is the actual scanner and in that helmet you have about 300 channels that spot simultaneously record electromagnetic waves emerging from the brain. And what we want to do is we want to record um, their brain activity not when they're having a seizure um, but in the in-between area because folks with epilepsy even between seizures have bursts of abnormal brain activity uh, which help us to very um, uh, closely localize where their seizures can come from. Those brain waves that we um, have obtained with the MEG get shifted over here and so each of these little squiggles that you see are a representation of the data obtained from a single MEG channel. And what I do is I come back here and I read these brain waves and this allows me to localize where um, a certain um, uh, burst of abnormal activity originates on the brain. So what we do is we, we um, read those brain waves and then we can model it to a point source on the brain which represents an area of abnormal activity. And then in conjunction with the surgeon we explore that area with electrodes and we try to perform epilepsy surgery in that area. It is helpful to have the EEG results, the video EEG monitoring and the MEG results um, because we can get an idea in our mind looking at the anatomic images um, as to where we're going to need to evaluate things and, and oftentimes when I speak with the epileptologist I will use that information uh, in considering my opening and placement of grids in people who need a two-stage procedure. Uh, so yes, it's very helpful. 
it's incredible how much it helps people. One of the things that the patients themselves aren't completely aware of, or maybe even their family members, is the slow decline that they have over time. When the brain keeps having these disruptions in its activity with the seizures, it just doesn't function as well. And so it's interesting to see after surgery, sometimes patients have, I always tell people they may feel a little punk or something for a while and not quite be themselves. And that I believe is from things reorganizing. You, you, you've changed how things are uh, connected there. And after that period ends, if they do have that, it's really exciting to see how happy they are, how much better they feel, uh, and they can compare it to how they were before and, and it's really noticed then by the patients and their families. Very often I have, I have folks come back to clinic and, and tell me that they've just gotten their driver's license back and they're back to work and their their memory's better and they can function in society again. And um, while, we, while we see a lot of folks like this and while it's, you know, it's the expectation that we make them that way, uh, it still drives the point home that uh, what we're doing is very important and we're, we're really um, changing folks' lives for the better. And so my feeling is that if you do have epilepsy, uh, it, uh, it behooves you certainly to, um, to take a look at, at where your life is and um, see if it's time to perhaps explore uh, what else is out there. <laughs>